Good morning. And welcome to worship this morning at United Church of Christ Congregational, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we're glad you joined us this morning for worship, wherever you may be, in your home, in your car, in your yard, on your path, I mean, wherever. We're really glad that you've taken the time to, um, to check us out and worship with us this morning. I want to share with you a, a greeting, a piece that was written by um, Donna Scopper. Donna Scopper is a pastor in the New York Conference United Church of Christ, and Donna writes these words. Feasting is a sign of your reign, O God. It is a picture of the joy you intend for all people all the time. Let us raise our glasses first to you and then to each other. And let us promise to live in the feast, now and always. Amen. We're going to be talking about feasting a little bit later this morning. Let's um, get together and sing. Let's sing, Lead Me, Guide Me. If you printed out the bulletin, it's, it's right there.
please join me in the gathering prayer. For all that you give us, O God, and all that beckons us forward, we give you thanks. For daily bread you offer us, and for sustaining us on the journey, we give you thanks. For the diversity you create, and the unity we find in that diversity, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. I want to, as we come to our time of prayer, remind you that you can <coughs> text your prayer requests to 585-857-8267, and um, I will share them with the community here from this place. Um, I have a, a mm -hmm. prayer request that I'd like to share for um, Emily and Amanda. Uh, they're sisters and part of our extended family. <coughs> And um, both of them, sisters, both recently um, became moms and um, both are dealing with a diagnosis of breast cancer. Um, it was discovered that it was caused by a genetic mutation. So um, they are both beginning surgeries and treatment and our thoughts and prayers are, are with um, Amanda and Emily and their families and their extended families, and we pray God's blessing upon you as you as you move forth. Um, Jan Farling texts in prayers, please, for our brother-in-law who just found out that he has more brain tumors. So our thoughts and prayers are with the, that family as well. Um, I want to take a little point of personal privilege this morning and ask for your prayers for our son Billy and his wife Nicole and actually for our whole family. Um, Billy and Nicole and we are all grieving the loss of their baby, little Evelyn, who um, was 20 weeks in the womb and we don't know what happened, but um, Evelyn didn't make it and our thoughts and prayers continue. Our, we're heartbroken as they are, as friends and family come together to uh, offer support. Thank you all for your prayers for those of you who knew and helped us through this and for your prayers and support. We'll be going down to be with them uh, this week. So um, continue to keep us in our thoughts and prayers as we have a memorial service for little baby Evelyn this week. Let's be together in prayer. And as we begin, remind us, O oh God, of your love for us, your love for us all, Hold us, and as the song goes, lead us and guide us. Let your arms reach out and enfold us. For those who have gone back to school this week full time, God, we give you thanks and we pray for your protection on all those folks who have gone back, students and teachers. And while we're happy that kids can be with their friends and be back in classrooms, we pray for safety and for health for them as they do it. God, for all those family and friends who continue to deal with COVID and its effects, we ask your blessing upon each and every one and pray your presence of protection on all of us as we continue to mask and be careful as we approach herd immunity. For those who are getting vaccines, we pray for, um, for your comfort and your support as they go forward. God, we, we know that there are places on this planet that are struggling. We know that there are places in our own country in our nation 
that are struggling. For the families who have lost loved ones to gun violence, God, we lift them up to you and pray your presence in their lives. For our own city, for Rochester, and the shootings that have been happening there, God, we, we pray your peace to come upon these communities that they may feel that presence and that instead of hate, they may find love in the hearts of their neighbors and friends. And God, for this congregation gathered here this day and gathered across the nation, joining us via Facebook, watching later in the day by YouTube, being in the parking lot and listening on the radio. God, bless us as we strive to continue to be your church in the world today. And may we remember that we are the hands and the feet and the heart and the soul of Jesus. And we pray for your blessing upon our ministry and our mission and all that we do. And God, we give you thanks for the gift of silence. A silence where we can stop and take a deep breath. And as we feel the rhythm of our breath, we let you know the things that are troubling us, the things that are weighing most on our hearts and in our minds. Things we don't say out loud. So in this silence, oh God, hear our prayer. And hear us, God, as we pray the prayer that Jesus shared with his disciples when they asked him, what should we pray? How should we pray? What do we say? And Jesus said, you might try words like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And even though we can't run across the aisle or reach around the pews behind us and offer each other the greeting of peace, I invite you to take a moment and whoever you're with, extend the hand of God's peace. Or if you're on Facebook this morning, you know, you can type in peace um, into the responses and share peace with those others who are watching. If you're in the parking lot, toot your horn and let us know we're feeling God's peace this morning. But take a moment and share God's peace. Thank you for participating, um, however it is that you're doing that from home, from your car, um, it really matters. There's, there's so much pain these days and so many hearts are hurting and you know sometimes what's most important is that we show up and showing up these days is often via virtually, but just keep doing that. You, you matter. It makes a difference. And and your particular person and the way you show you care matters to the people who need to know that they are cared about. The um, psalm today is Psalm 23. The Lord 
is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He does restore my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I need fear no evil, for you, O oh God, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Amen. <laughs> I remember a time as a kid being outside after school, playing with a friend and having such a great time and not wanting our time together to end. I would drag that friend into the house and ask my mother, 
Can David stay for supper tonight? Anybody else ever do that? Anybody as parents have kids do that? When they show up with this child in tow in the kitchen, and how can you say no? But what was your mom's usual reply, or your reply? Was your mom ever surprised or uncomfortable with the pal you dragged into the house to share your supper table with? Are any of you old enough to remember the 1967 film, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Maybe some of you who like old movies have just seen it. Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn are the very liberal, progressive, open-minded Draytons who are about to welcome their daughter Joanna and her new fiancé, Dr. John Prentice, home for a visit and a wonderful dinner with family and friends. Imagine our daughter marrying a doctor. Well, the doctor, the future son-in-law, is played by Sidney Poitier, African-American. And when Joanna and John arrive at the door, I'm sorry, when, yeah, Joanna and John arrive at the family home, at the door, the Dragons, in all of their liberal progressiveness, answer the door, and they don't know what to say or do or think, or how to act. Now, if you've seen this movie, then maybe as we go along, you can understand my uneasiness with a certain part of Psalm 23. Do you all know Psalm 23? Did, did, have you heard it before today? I think it's one of those psalms that most of us could probably say, from memory if we had to. Now I know that many people find the words of this psalm comforting and reassuring, and I would have to agree, at least some of it. My struggle doesn't come with the image of comfort. It doesn't come with God the shepherd imagery. That's beautiful stuff. My struggle is not with still waters or easy paths. And while dark valleys or death valley, if you read uh, Peterson's uh, reference. Even though those places can be foreboding and maybe dangerous, that imagery doesn't really disturb me too much either. Where I get hung up, what has caused me to think and rethink this psalm every time I encounter it is, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Think about that for a minute. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. These words cause me the greatest amount of struggle with Psalm 23. And yet I think it's the most important part, as well as the most difficult to understand piece of Psalm 23. You see, how I read that sentence is that at the table of God, all my enemies will be present. Everyone, everyone has a seat at God's table. Wow. When I was serving my first church in Penn West Conference, I used to receive the monthly newsletter from the Biblical Witness Fellowship of the United Church of Christ. And I, I just I'd throw it out before I even looked at it because the headlines were usually enough to make me upset. The BWF, as it was referred to, was a group of, of I think, narrow-minded, Bible-thumping, gay-bashing, fundamental right-wing folks who happened to be members of UCC congregations across the country. You see, BWF congregations are the exact opposite of ONA, or open and affirming congregations, where welcome and diversity is concerned. Anyway. I remember going to my associate conference minister at the time about this BWF newsletter and how I just throw it in the trash as soon as it came out of the mailbox. And he told me, Carl, Ken had such a calm, mean, comforting demeanor. 
It's a Kara. You need to read it. It's important. You need to see the other side. You need to see what others are thinking in the United Church of Christ. And remember that there is a place for everyone at the table in the United Church of Christ. I remember telling people at my ecclesiastical council for ordination how wonderful it was that there is room for all in the UCC and how distressing it was that there is room for all in the UCC. And over the years, I've discovered how important it is to dialogue with folks who don't see things the way I do or believe the same as I or understand the theology the same as I, but also how uncomfortable it can be to not see things or believe or understand the same as I. Sometimes it's difficult to learn how to be in this incredible mix that we call the United Church of Christ. Eugene Peterson, in the message, reinterprets the text from Psalm 23 a little differently. He says, you serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. Now that sounds quite different to me. In fact, I'm not sure that Peterson really gets it right here. He describes a kind of in-your-face situation. It's like, ha-ha, and he's looking at me. I got a six-course dinner. What do you got? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think the point the psalmist really wants to make is the good shepherd is shepherd of all. And in that time of reconciliation and peace, there is finally a realization that all God's creation has a place at the table. So instead of thumbing my nose at Chucky Talama, who used to call me fathead and throw sticks into my spokes as I rode my bike past his house, instead of me saying, I'm getting a full course meal and you're not, Chucky Talama was sitting right next to me at the banquet table, enjoying dinner. And what am I going to do about it? Instead of relishing in the fact that Joey Shear got busted for setting our neighbor's doghouse on fire after telling him it was me that did it, he's sitting right across me at the table from me, sharing good wine and good food because everyone has a seat at the table. And what do I think about that? I mean, imagine it. Mother Teresa dining with Charles Manson. Theologian Ryan Niebuhr and atheist Madeline Murray O'Hare. FDR and Adolf Hitler. Ronald Reagan and Saddam Hussein. You see my discomfort? Everyone has a seat at the table. How does that make you feel? I know I say it often, that sharing a meal is one of the most sacred images in both Old and New Testament writing. A table is set and spread with all good gifts, gifts of love and mercy and grace and peace. Nourishment for body and soul, the bodies and souls of all God's people. Reminds me, in the Oakland section of downtown Pittsburgh, right across the street, basically kitty corner from the University of Pittsburgh, there's a, there's a church, and it's called the Community of Reconciliation. And members of that church are traditionally Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, UCC, and Lutheran. They're black and white. They're young and old. They're gay and straight. They're Democrat and Republican. You see, in the late 80s, churches in the Oakland section of Pittsburgh were all struggling. They're struggling to redefine themselves in this enormous college community and stake a little claim to their neighborhood. They were all fighting for students from Pitt and from Carnegie Mellon to come and worship and make our churches alive again. And one of the pastors had the idea of coming together and inviting the college community to worship in a service of reconciliation after a series of arson fires in the area, one of which destroyed all but the steeple of one Presbyterian church. So they met there. 
They met there in the burned out foundation of that church. Hundreds of church members and students and faculty. They sang and they prayed and they worshiped together. And someone said, now wouldn't this be great every Sunday? So instead of fighting with each other for new members, they shared what they had. And a few years later, on that very site, with the steeple of that old burned down church as the cornerstone, the Community of Reconciliation building was dedicated. And all were welcomed at the same table. I think that's the, expre the vision expressed in the words, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The shepherd host calls us to this very kind of community, a community that I think Webster UCC embraces quite beautifully most of the time. It's very clear who's been invited. Oh, it's not perfect. There's a little work to be done, but for the most part, the table is set. And just take a look at who's coming to dinner. Amen. church, and I said, um, so what, what brought you here? What brought you to Webster and UCC? And they said, well, the Sunday that we visited, everyone welcomed us. We never felt so welcomed as we did in this church. And, and she said, and your sermon was about something that was happening in the world, and she said it was, it was you know, something we needed to hear. And she said, and everybody was so kind, and she said, but then Alexa played Chopin. And we looked at each other and said, this is it. <laughs> and I think it was that piece, actually. But 
uh, thank you, thank you for sharing. So what in God's name are we doing um, this week? Today, uh, 11.30, is Kids Zoom with Wendy, so watch for that. The uh, youth group will be meeting here um, at noon. And guys, um, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's uh, a load of topsoil and a load of mulch out in the driveway today. I think you're going to be busy. <laughs> so show up and um, get, that, um, get those garden beds ready for another season. Um, also, uh, this week, Tuesday evening, will be Carl and Wendy's Lectionary Adventure. And, um, and then we do it all again beginning next Sunday. So um, if there's anything more that comes up, I certainly will certainly make sure you get a, an email. And um, again, thank you all for, for your kindness, for your love, and for your support. So as we go forward, we go forward with these words. Friends, let us love. Not in word or speech, but in but faith, in, faith, in truth, truth, and in action. action. Go into the world in peace to love and serve God. Amen. And now I invite you to join us in singing, I'm going to sit at the welcome table. And even if you didn't print it out, I bet very quickly you can catch on to the piece. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six verses that all kind of repeat themselves. So if you hear the first line, I'm sure you've got it. So join us. Mm -hmm. 